Good morning. Let's go ahead and stand and sing with us as we sing Victory in Jesus. Basically our anthem. beneath the cleansing blood. Say amen. 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 What a way to kick off our service this morning. It's a joy to see you at Victory Baptist on this another Sunday that God's blessed us. Give us an opportunity to come together, fellowship with some of the finest folks on the face of this earth, to get into the Word of God and let's let Him teach us from His Word and go out of here empowered, ready to serve Him during the week. Amen. 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 Now, if you're a guest today, we never want you to feel like a guest or an outsider. Normally, we'll just be shaking your hand and hugging your neck, putting a kiss on your cheek, and, well, maybe not the kiss part. But, you know, with COVID and pandemic and all that stuff, we salute you from a distance, okay? But so glad to have you with us, and, and uh, we're much in prayer today for this hour that it will be a blessing, not just another service, okay? And so before we go any further, with that in mind, let's bow for prayer and thank God today for this opportunity and ask His blessings in His presence. Brother Max Cronin, would you lead us in prayer, please?
Remain standing if you would today. The songwriter said, would you be free from your burden of sin? Then there's power in the blood, the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse us from all sin, A-L-L. And the Bible says we're not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but by the precious blood of Jesus. Sing it out from your heart to God's ears this morning. that did. All righty. He didn't get the memo, did he? You may, be see, you may be seated this morning. Amen. I hope you had an opportunity to prepare your offering today. And during the pandemic, we've been meeting and, and not taking up a collection, but we have offering boxes at both of our exits, so this one on the side and the one in the front. And I hope you've had that opportunity. There are uh, envelopes at the table the front and also in the foyer. And a dear sweet lady, a member of this church, asked me to come by. She can't be here today and pick hers up on Friday. And I've got hers and got mine. And so I hope that you've come prepared to be faithful. Folks have been just really good during this time to give and to help keep the work of Christ going on through these times when it's needed so desperately. Amen? Amen. I'm so thankful and grateful also for the media that we have and able to do things today. We have our live on, uh, on the internet broadcast, telecast of our service. And uh, so a lot of churches are doing that. There was a time you couldn't do any kind of television or anything because it was so expensive. But now you get some equipment and, and Brother Steve works on that and has upgraded this one and, and twice, I believe, something like that, isn't it? And so uh, we can carry out to our folks that are joining us this morning from home or wherever it is. Um, Thank you, Doug. This is my better side, JT, over here, okay? 
my son is uh, being appreciated today. Uh, my son is preaching today and filling in for his pastor, who he's on staff at a church in Lexington, Kentucky. And so their live broadcast is on. And then, of course, ours is. Miss Becky's at home. She had an allergic reaction to something, and her left eye is all swollen up, and her ear's swollen, and she's at home this morning. So now she can listen to her husband, watch him, or her son, watch him. Who do you think wins? Don't you know it? Don't get no respect, I'm telling you. <laughs> Amen. So uh, it's just amazing that we can do those things that we never could in times past. But I'm grateful and thankful to the Lord, all of the modern conveniences He's given us that can be used to get the gospel out. Amen. Especially during these times, right? So that you remember that, I ask you this morning. Thankful to the Lord for all of His many blessings that He's given us. I hope and trust you and your family are healthy. Everybody's doing okay. Let's take a praise or two or three this morning, all right? Just want to say, I praise the Lord for. Barbara, what do you praise the Lord for today? Salvation. Salvation, number one on the list right there. Amen. Melanie, what do you praise the Lord for today? Church family, amen. Amen. It's good to have a church family, brothers and sisters. Yes. Grace and for His healing power. And He's still... Amen, bud. God bless you. We give praises to Him also. So good to see you today. Amen. Who's next? Yes, Brother Ernie. Being able to be here. Amen. The empty tomb. We serve a living Savior. It's in the world today, the songwriter said. Amen. Aren't you glad of that? Somebody in the back had a hand up. Amen, Phyllis. Great granddaughter. Wow, she's precious. Hey, we sure will. Amen. Kayla, do you have your hand up? For God's Word. Never take for granted. We have an advantage over saints of many generations and centuries ago that we can carry with us in our hand the Word of God. Wow. And so we need to be about the business of reading it and studying it, don't we? Just a few of the things today. We always want to remember and be thankful for Him in, in a very special way. Let's go to the Lord in prayer again. And if you have an unspoken request on your heart at this time, just slip your hand up and say, Preacher, help me pray. God knows my heart. He knows the need. God bless you. God bless you this morning. All over this auditorium, are there, are there others? God bless. Yes, God bless you. Let's lift these up to Christ. Amen. Lay these, all, these requests at the feet of Jesus this morning. Brother Junior Davis, would you lead us in prayer, please, sir? Yes. All of God's people say, Amen. Amen. The praise trio is coming. I thank God for you all. I want you to know that I praise Him. You're doing a great job today. Well, two of you are. <laughs> I'm picking on you. <laughs> Amen. One of my favorite songs, we've been through all kind of storms in this country and this world, haven't we? Upheaval in social situations and riots and we're in election season in case nobody, everybody heard there's an election coming up. And so all of the things we worry about sometime and we shouldn't, but we do. But think about the words of this song, keep me safe until the storm passes by, all right? Sing it with the trio.
around them, we need reminders, don't we? Yes. Amen. Thank the Lord this morning. If you have your Bibles and will turn with me this morning, we're going to the Old Testament book of 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 9. And if you have the Schofield Reference Bible, that's page number 364, 364, 2 Samuel chapter 9. And I'll begin reading in just a few minutes at verse number 1. I've always thought about some, and I love to preach out of the Old Testament, but there are denominations and, uh, that don't believe that you ought to even, even touch the Old Testament, that it's all completed, it's been fulfilled, we're not under law, and that part's right. But yet, the Bible said in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Amen? For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And in 54 AD, when that was written, the New Testament hadn't even been completed, nor had it been assembled, you know, in the canon of Scripture. All they had just about was some of the Old Testament. So you miss out on some of the great blessings. We saw in our study of Judges that the Lord Jesus Himself made appearances in the Old Testament. And when you read in the Old Testament of something about the angel of the Lord, that usually refers to Christ. Some people believe He only came into existence in the mangers, the manger in Bethlehem, don't they? Well, He's the eternal God who always has been, always will be. Don't try to figure it out. Just faith it out. Amen? Amen to that. You can trip a breaker real easy trying to figure God out. Now, come on. And I don't bow down before a God who's not any more great and intelligent and knowledgeable than I am. So that's no surprise that I can't figure out all the things of God. But the part I can figure is a blessing. Amen? 2 Samuel chapter 9 is one of the most beautiful pictures in the Old Testament of grace that would be found in the Old Testament. And it talks about a man who desperately needed some help, didn't deserve it, didn't earn it. And we're going to see a, a definition here or a picture of grace. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse number 1. And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? You remember King Saul had uh, sought David's life, tried to kill him, chased after him, got very close at times and almost killed him. He was jealous of David's popularity. He didn't want David to succeed him to the throne. And so David literally had to run for his life for many years. Now Saul died. And so David's coming to the throne, all right? It's been like something like 20 years, 22, since David had been anointed to be the king. And so uh, David's best friend, David's best buddy, had been Saul's son, Jonathan. They were as thick as bees. And, uh, and so, you know, before Jonathan died, he made David promise that if anything happened to him, and by the way, he was killed as was his dad Saul in the same battle, but he made David promise that he would show kindness to his house when he became king. And David said, okay. Now David's remembering that promise that he made, that vow that he made to Jonathan. So notice here, he said again, that I may show kindness, show kindness for Jonathan's sake. And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? He said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto him, The king, Jonathan hath yet a son which is lame on his feet. Now Jonathan had a son, but there was a problem the son had, and he was lame. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. All right, now remember, Lodabar in the Hebrew tongue meant pastureless, pastureless or barren. All right, here he is, and picturing the, the lost sinner in the world and a barren country. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the word of God and the knowledge that we can hold in our hands, the infallible, inerrant word of God. And I'm praying this morning now the lesson that you can teach us from this passage for the 21st century. 
May we be better Christians and servants of yours today than we were yesterday and keep improving until Jesus comes. I'm asking you to have your way in every life and every heart. Those that are watching live by means of the internet, those that are assembled here in our auditorium, I pray a special blessing this morning and the guidance and leadership of your Holy Spirit. In Christ's sweet holy name I pray, amen. Now, Jonathan had a son. His name was, and it's, I wouldn't even try to spell it, but hard enough to pronounce it. Mephibosheth, we're going to find out. Mephibosheth. That's a good name, though, come to think of it. You ever heard anybody naming their kid today Mephibosheth? Hey, Mephibosheth, get in here and put that bicycle up and come in for dinner. Well, Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, grandson of Saul, was coming to David. David summoned him to the capital, to the palace. And here's the thing about it. Mephibosheth had been crippled when he was five years old. He had a nurse that was fleeing with him in her arms, and she dropped him. That's all we know. And he grew, has grown now up as an adult man, crippled in both of his feet. He had a flaw. He had a problem. He was crippled in his feet. And so there was nothing he could offer David. He wasn't wealthy. He was living in someone else's house. He was living in a land that was a barren land, a pastureless land. So he didn't have anything to offer. This was pure love, pure grace that King David is exempting, exemplifying to this descendant of King Saul. Now think about it. Folks, today, you and I are crippled. We're crippled by sin. We came into this world. We were born sinners. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's no perfect people. I've met people who thought they were, but I got news for you. They weren't. Amen? Amen. And so a preacher was asking one time if anybody knew of a perfect person. An old fellow raised his hand. He said, well, Brother Joe, you mean, do you know somebody that's perfect? Yes, my wife's first husband. Oh, wow. So I'm telling you today, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We fall short. You do. I do. The very best of us here today, the very best of us is still a sinner in need of the grace of God. So if you look at this story here today, and grace, I like, there's various definitions, but grace is God's mercy to us that we did not earn. Or somebody said, it's extending favor to one who does not deserve it, has not earned it, can never repay it, nor is supposed to repay it. So think with me about that. David is looking for a way to demonstrate kindness to any of Saul's descendants. When he finds out about Mephibosheth, he demonstrates the mercy and the grace of God in how he treats this crippled young man. David's gracious treatment of Mephibosheth is a perfect picture of God's gracious treatment of you and me. Now, Mephibosheth didn't know what was going on. He was fearful that David may be going to kill him. See, it, was, it was a common practice in this day, in this day and time. And this is 3,000 years ago. Doesn't that just speak about the preservation of God's Word? That God has preserved it to us down through the centuries. And today we have an infallible, inerrant Word. But you can begin to think about it. It was very common in those days that when a new king come to the throne, he would kill all of the former king's relatives. And friends, he'd put them to death or perhaps banish them. He didn't want them vying for the throne. He didn't want them trying to overthrow him and claiming that they were the rightful king. So it was of common practice that they would wipe out the family of the former king. So Mephibosheth has no idea what the king wants to see him for. He's fearful. He's worried. Is he going to kill me? Is he going to banish me to some deserted island somewhere out in the ocean? He had no idea. So he comes into the palace fearful for his very life. Ladies and gentlemen today, he didn't realize that he had a friend in the king. Amen. You and I have a friend today who's a friend of sinners. People say today all the time, I don't feel worthy. We're not worthy. But God's grace means He loved us in spite of our faults, in spite of our, our crippledness, uh, spiritually speaking, that He loves us in spite of that. And so He's a friend of sinners. In Matthew chapter 11, His enemies, the Pharisees, the religiosity crowd of the day, slammed Him by this thing. They said, He's a friend of sinners and tax collectors. Think about that. Aren't you glad He's a friend of sinners? Aren't you glad of that? Where would we be today? 
In Luke chapter 7, there was a woman who brought an alabaster box and had some very precious ointment in it. And she anointed the feet of Jesus. She shed her tears and wiped his feet with her hair. And, and the, the Pharisee said, does he not know what kind of woman she is? He ought to rebuke her. She's a fallen woman. Listen, he's a friend of sinners. Amen. Jesus showed grace and mercy to her and he rebuked the religious crowd of his day. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus went into his home city early on in, in his ministry. He went to Nazareth in Luke chapter 4 and verse number 18. And I want you to notice he stood and he taught. And he, he taught from the book of, of Isaiah chapter 53. And he said this, 61, excuse me. And he said this because it referred to him as the Messiah. It says he's come to preach deliverance to the captives. Amen to preach deliverance to the captives, those who are captivated by Satan, those who are captivated by sin, those who have no hope, who are crippled by sin. He came for them. He came to save sinners, Paul said, of whom I am chief. Now you think about that with me. He lived in poverty, Mephibosheth did. He lived in desolation. Lodabar, no pasture, barren country. You and I in sin are barren. We're in a spiritual poverty. And one day we came to know Him as our personal Lord and Savior. Grace will seek us out when we're crippled and impoverished by Satan and by sin. There's nothing in us, folks, that would make us uh, desirable to the King. It's just His love for us. Secondly, look at this picture of grace in this example in the Old Testament. Grace bestows kindness to a helpless one for somebody else's sake. David was showing kindness for Jonathan's sake, his, his best friend, his best bud. In verse number one, again, look at it. David said, Is there yet any that is left in the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Look at verse number seven. And David said unto him, unto Mephibosheth, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt, notice here, eat bread at my table continuously. Wow, what a picture of grace. What a picture of God's love. What a picture today of the Christian life, the life of serving Christ, that we can eat bread from His table. Feasting at the table of God is what we're doing. This poor old cripple boy that probably had depended on other people all along for these years to get around. And now he's going to be able to sit at the king's table in the palace. He's going to move to Jerusalem, the capital. And not only that, but his grandpa, King Saul, all of the land and the possessions he had, David is saying, they're yours. I'm giving it to you. Let me tell you something today. God gave us the greatest gift of all when he saved us, and that is the gift of eternal salvation, that we could know that we're saved, that if we died in our sleep, when you go to bed at night, turn out the light and go to bed, pull the cover up around your neck. I'm telling you, if you die in your sleep and you know Jesus, you just wake up in heaven. Amen? You just transition from this world into the next one. You go through the gate called death and you arrive at a place where you will feast at the table of God forever and ever and live in His house. He said, where I am, there you may be also. And it's not because we deserved it. We're sinners, remember. It's not because we bought it and paid for it. It's not because we got baptized, sprinkled, or confirmed. It's not because we joined this church or another church. It's because one day, realizing we were lost, realizing our need for a Savior, believing as God's Word said that Jesus came, died on the cross for our sins, we put our faith and trust in Him and invited Him into our heart. And today we've been saved ever since that day. Not perfect. We're still lame. We still have to battle sin. But we're feasting from the table of God. The Bible says He gives us handfuls on purpose. It's every now and then. He sprinkles a little bit down upon us, gives us a little taste of glory, doesn't He? The best is yet to come. I like the previews though, don't you? I, I'm telling you one thing. I was just a young kid. I didn't come from a prominent family. My dad and mom were not on the social scale or the social register of Fort Wayne, Indiana. My parents moved a lot when I was growing up, and, but I kept finding them anyway. 
And, um, and my dad, in search of work to better take care of his family, we were living in Fort Wayne, Indiana, the coldest place I had ever been and have been since then in my life, I do believe. I can remember those winter days when it got cold and down below zero and wouldn't climb above zero for two, three, four days sometime. And the streets would just be like a sheet of ice. And I had to walk to school uphill five miles both ways, barefoot, you know. <laughs> and I carried my lunch in a pail, a bucket, amen, <laughs> amen. And so, but I'm telling you, I remember the Southern Baptist had a mission church out on the east part of town. And one thing my parents always did when we moved and went to different places, after we bought a house and or rented a house, the first thing we went looking for a church because all our family was going to be in church on Sundays and Wednesday night. And so I remember that night. It was a Sunday night. The preacher preached, and I was just probably fifth, fourth grade, fifth grade. No, it was fourth grade. And, um, and I don't remember the sermon, but I remember the tug at my heartstrings. I remember the Holy Spirit bidding me to go forward, and I went forward an invitation, and I bowed there in that little mission church, and that's one another reason I'm so pro-missions right there. And I bowed right there in the mission church and invited Jesus into my heart. And let me tell you something. I've been saved. I've been a child of the God. I have been eaten from His table ever since then. You've been perfect? No, absolutely not. But He didn't stop loving me. He didn't stop caring about me. And I'm telling you today, if you become His family, He will care for you like that too. And there are times that, yes, when you stray and you do wrong, He has to discipline you. But He does that out of a heart of love because He wants you to be a child that He can be pleased with and be proud of. Now, I'm saying to you today that here's a picture. Grace seeks us out when we're, when we're not worthy. Grace bestows kindness to a helpless one for another's sake. For Jesus' sake, because He loved us, went to the cross, and died for us, God the Father extends forgiveness and kindness to us because of another. Mephibosheth was able to live in the palace because of the kindness of another. In 1 John chapter 2, and verse 12, the Apostle John said, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for His name's sake. Amen. Notice that. Amen. Amen. And then look at Isaiah chapter 53 and verse number 5. Very, very pertinent scripture in prophecy. The prophet looked down through the telescope of prophecy. He saw the day the Messiah would come and said he was wounded for our, transgre our transgressions. He was bruised for our sins or our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And notice the last part. With his literal stripes that he suffered at the cross were healed from the sickness of sin. Were healed from an eternity. Saved from eternity. Separated from God throughout. All because of what he did. And grace was bestowed to me. Kindness for another's sake. And then lastly, in this little story of Mephibosheth today, I want you to notice something in verse 5. Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machir, the son of Emil, from Lodabar. And when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, I will surely show thee kindness. You're going to eat at my table, bread from my table, continuously. Notice that. And I'm telling you, verse number 8 says, And he bowed himself down, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I? Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, Now here's one of the great things about God. He says, Ziba, Ziba, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants we find out here in just a minute just how many he had, shall till the land for him. <laughs> Notice that. Ain't God good? I'm telling you what here. Not only is Mephibosheth going to live in Jerusalem, and not only is he going to eat at the king's table, some pretty good uh, uh, food there, I'd say, wouldn't you? And so he said, you, Ziba, and your boys, and we find out in this verse he had uh, 15 sons and 20 service, servants. You've got 35 uh, people there to help you out. You're going to till his property and raise his crops that he can raise, and he's going to hear, sit at my table. 
<laughs> Amen. There's probably a lesson there that means that the deacons are supposed to t feed the, uh, the, the, the pastor or something. But I, it's probably in the originals, Brother Walton, Brother Junior, and somewhere in there. Thou therefore and thy son and thy servant shall till the land for him and shall bring in the fruits of thy master's son and have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, will eat, it, uh, will eat bread at, always at my table. And now Z Ziba and the 15 sons he had in 20 servants. Boy, I'm telling you something today. Always. That's eternal security, isn't it? Then said Ziba unto the king, according to all that the Lord thy king hath commanded his servant, as, as so shall thy servant do. As Mephibosheth said the, uh, the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. You get that? He's not just going to be this poor old kid I'm showing mercy to. He's going to be as one of my sons. When you come to Jesus Christ as your Savior, and the grace of God is extended to you. You become part of the family. You become a, a child of God, a son of God, a child of God. Mephibosheth expected that he was going to be executed, but instead he was made one of the king's sons. You know, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, the apostle Paul said, He will be a father unto you and shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. He's the father and we're his sons and daughters. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, Paul again said this, Ye are all, what's the next three words? Children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. We're not the, the poor old poor people that God showed mercy to. We're a child of the King. We're son, sons of God. We're into the family of God. I, we sing that song around here so often about the family of God. And I'm telling you today, it's because of the blood of Jesus shed at the cross that grace and mercy has been extended. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. God's grace seeks us out when we're crippled and impoverished by Satan and by sin. Grace bestows kindness to a helpless one for another's sake. And then grace makes family out of enemies. Thank God for it. Amen. Thank God. Warren Wiersbe is a great teacher and a great preacher was he's in heaven now but he told a story about many years ago in the in the west there was a little boy sitting in a wagon hooked up to a horse and that horse got all spooked and upset and he went running wildly away and that little boy was about to be thrown out probably run over and killed but there was a young man there that day and he went running and chased that down that wagon down was able to get up on it and bring it to a stop and saved that little boy's life well, years went by, Wiersbe says. Years went by, and that little boy grew up, got into a lot of trouble with the law. His life was just going down and down and down into great crime, into great problems and great sin. He was put on trial for a serious capital offense, and he was found guilty, and he stood before the judge to be sentenced. He walked up before the judge, and he thought, man, I've got it made. I've just now figured out who this judge is. This judge is the guy that saved him when he was a young man, the judge, years ago, and the convict to be, was a little boy. He said, I've got it made. And so he reminded the judge of that. You remember me. I'm the one you saved. And the judge said this, and this is the point where he's trying to make. The judge said this, Then I was your Savior. Today I must be your judge. Now, during this age of grace, he wants to be your Savior. But if you won't allow that, one day you'll stand before him and you'll be his he will be your judge. And you will hear him say, depart from me, I never knew you. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for the lessons that we learned from the Old Testament, from the New Testament. The beautiful picture of grace that because of another, there was a crippled man who had mercy and love and kindness bestowed upon him. And Father, I'm asking you this morning right now to speak to hearts all over this auditorium, those that are joining us today live and perhaps later today or later this week. I pray, Father, that if there's anyone that doesn't know Jesus Christ in the free pardon of sin, I pray that you help them realize that you're extending grace, mercy, love, and kindness to them, not because we deserve it, 
but because of another, your son who died at the cross. And Lord, today you took care of the hard part when you died for our sins. We're so unmercifully treated. And I'm praying now, Father, that we'll take the easy part and let you come into our heart and into our life and to be our Savior. You give the invitation. You speak to hearts, I pray. And I'm asking that there are those here today who need to take advantage of forgiving grace. They may not be serving you as they once did. Perhaps there were days that they were closer to Christ. There were days, Lord, that, that they were serving you in church and living for you. And, but something happened, and today they've laid down the cross and strayed away. May this be the day they'll come home and move up closer. You said draw near to you, and you would draw near to us. The first move is ours. I pray you give the invitation. Our heads are bowed for just a moment today. As God speaks to your heart, let me ask you today. The invitation is open. Would you just slip out right now and say, yes, yes. You can find a place here at the altar, or you can pray right where you are. What about it this morning, would you? Thank you this morning so much for your attention, for your presence, for your prayers. And let me remind you as we dismiss today that the ones toward the front go out the side door and toward the back half go out the front doors, okay? We ask that you not congregate in the foyers. And if you want to do that outside, that's certainly in order. We're so glad you're here. Don't forget coming up a week from this Wednesday, we start back with some of our Wednesday night lineup, all right? We have a most unusual Wednesday night service here. Years ago as a pastor, I began to notice that some, so many of the people on Wednesday night who come in come from work and they're tired, they've had a rough day, and it's kind of like, boy, I'm here, that's about all I can say. And I understand that. So I tried to make from day one the Wednesday service a little bit different, a little more exciting and some things that we do a little differently to be a blessing and a help. And I'm a firm believer, as the Bible says, that a merry heart doth good like a medicine. So we use a bit of humor and have some group discussion with the group. And, and we sing and we do prayer. It is prayer meeting. We do pray, uh, praise and prayer time. And that's going to crank back up on Wednesday, a week from this coming Wednesday, October the 21st at 7 o'clock. Now, for the kiddos, the children on Wednesday night, we're starting up something in lieu of Awana until we can get back to the Awana program. We're starting on October the 21st also at 7 uh, for children up to the high school age. Something we call Jam, Wednesday Night Jam. Jesus and me, all right? Jesus and me for children up to high school. There'll be no uh, van or bus running. There'll be no food, but it'll just be a time to be socially distanced. There's going to be a time of, of singing and praying and praise and, and games and some crafts from 7 to 8 o'clock or close to it on Wednesday night for the kids. Wednesday night jam. Don't forget that, okay? All kicks off a week from Wednesday. So you be much in prayer about it. Tell folks you know about it. Let's stand and be dismissed this morning. Thank you for coming today. I appreciate it so much, each and every one that's here on this Lord's Day. And Brother Walt, would you dismiss us, please? over us till we come this way again. Help us always to be thankful, Lord, for what's accomplished in your precious name. Amen.
Have a great day, and I'll see you here, there, or in the air.